The Glendale Road Church of Christ proudly presents a weekly exploration of the Word of our living God. This is It Is Written with Minister Stephen Hunter. I think we all know what it's like to be tired. Some of us understand what it's like to be physically tired after a long day of laboring and just using our bodies to do whatever work we have before us. Others of us understand what it's like to be mentally tired. That is to be so engaged with your mind that come the end of the day you just wiped out. And then there are some, some of us, interestingly enough, we may have a day here or there where we sit around and do nothing the whole day, and then at the end of the day we said, I didn't do a thing all day, but I'm tired. You know, and so you can actually be tired from doing nothing, I suppose. But Jesus, at the evening of this particular day, He had been engaging with people and with great crowds of folks, teaching, answering some questions, and uh, interacting. And the result of that was when evening came, they obviously got in the boat to go to the other side, but Jesus was tired, and so He, he, he took a little nap in that boat. And while He took a nap, this great storm came upon the boat and upon the sea on which they were situated. And it obviously panicked all those who were there. And so through their panic, they, they worried about, you know, is, is, is everything going to be okay? And, and water begins to come into the boat. Now, if you've ever been on a lake and water starts coming in the boat, that's a bad thing. Okay? Uh, it's not supposed to, have, it's supposed to stay outside the boat. But when it gets in the boat, that's a bad thing. And so they were really worried at that point. And, Master, do you not care that we're perishing? And of course, just as you read and heard read a moment ago, he, Jesus, rebuked the storm, peace be still, and it was. And then, after rebuking the storm, he addressed their faith. Now, we might think that in that circumstance that, you know, Lord, you'd, we'd kind of hope for a little bit of understanding. After all, this great storm came upon us, we were a little worried about it, and you were taking a nap. Don't know how you were sleeping through the midst of this, but you know, some people can, right? A few weeks ago, we had some bad storms come through the area, and some of you lost sleep that night, and some of the rest of us slept more soundly than we ever have. But that just goes to show some of us are weird, and you can decide which is which. But storms keep some people away, and some people, they just sleep right through them. But Jesus addressed their faith because there was something greater that should have been focused on by His disciples than everything that was right in front of them. And I think that's just human nature. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's hard to not focus on matters of faith when what you have right in front of you are physical elements that have just shaken your boat, if you will, if you'll allow me the analogy. And so we get a little displaced, we get a little upset, and we get a little worried, and we get a little panicked and anxious, and, and, and Lord, do you not care that we're perishing? Now, metaphorically speaking, we all are either going through, have been through, or at some point will go through some sort of storm that really upsets us, that really unsettles us. But one of the most important things that we can always remember that no matter what we face, God is big enough to see me through the storm. And they're not always pleasant. Storms typically aren't. And in the interim, while you're waiting on the Lord to see you through the storm, we sometimes give over to worry, to fear, and uh, we sometimes feed those fears and those worries by something even greater than that. And everything that we encounter is the worst thing possible. You ever notice that when folks are in a vulnerable position or vulnerable stage of life and something bad is happening to them, it seems that everything that happens to them is bad. Even if it seems good and, you know, and, and sometimes when folks are hurting, the last thing they want are one of these positive people to come around and say, hey, it's going to be okay. Hey, everything's just great, right? Some, do you ever just want to look at those folks and just go, would you just shut up? I, maybe just let me be miserable for a second at least. You know, some folks revel in their misery. Some folks, are they always see it as, as Mother Maybelle Carter and, and her daughters used to sing, they always see the sunny side of life. But some folks, 
Not so much. Let's look at a little bit of this text and get a great, greater understanding of what's happening. First of all, uh, the Sea of Galilee, where they were, is 680 feet below the Mediterranean Sea. Now, let me explain to you how this would have worked out with this storm. Y'all know what a holler is? Anybody know what a holler? And I don't mean, hey, I don't mean that kind of holler. It, it, it's terrain, a holler. Is what, uh, H-O-L-L-O-W is what city folk might call it, but we call it a holler. So this sea was kind of situated in what we might call a holler. And you know, when, when winds and gusts get down in that holler, boy, it just makes all kinds of racket. And it's just very, very dangerous. Now, the family farm where I grew up on, our house was in a holler. And anytime there was a tornado that was stirring or a tornado watch, tornado warning, whatever the case is, uh, Daddy would always say to us, because we had this, this uh, storm shelter at my Uncle Bo's house about 100 yards down from ours. And this thing was built into the side of the hill. And so if we could get in that, you know, it might tear up the houses and the trees and everything around there, but that tornado would not get into the side of that hill. And so someone long ago built that, and we knew if a tornado ever got down in the holler, you had to run for the storm shelter and get in there fast. Now, Daddy would always say, we should be all right, he said, but if a tornado ever gets down in the holler, he said, it will tear everything up and it won't get out. He said, it's almost like ping pong, or not ping pong, uh, pinball machines. When you hit the thing and it does the tick 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 you know, it kind of bounces off all the things. He said, that's about how a tornado would be in a holler. So here they are in the Sea of Galilee, and when these winds get down in there, and this area was known for when the gusts got down in there, it was just horrible. But Matthew's account of this, in Matthew 8.24, he used a couple of words that give us a little bit of insight as to how bad it was. Seismos megos. Ooh, that makes us sound smart, doesn't it? Greek lesson of the day. Seismos. We get our word seismograph, seismic shift. All those are associated with what? An earthquake, right? And megas, mega, big. So Matthew is essentially saying it's like a big earthquake came upon us all of a sudden. And that's how bad it was. If you're on that boat, and obviously you're not on the earth, but on the sea and it's nice and calm, you just float right along fine. But if you get the idea of a mega or a large earthquake, you know, the boat shaking this way or the other, and it's rock. And you know, I tell you, you get on, some of you know, you get on Kentucky Lake on a windy day, it's rough. It is no fun at all to be on. We were on Kentucky Lake years ago one day. Boat ran out of gas. And we weren't back in one of the coves. We were kind of on the, 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 the river part of it. And boy, I thought, some of those, and you know, it's so nice of people when they see you there and you're trying to wave for help, and they just go by you as fast as they can and create the biggest waves. Isn't that sweet? So we had a lot of those, and boy, that boat was just, whoo, and I, you know, I learned right then and there that I would never be a bull rider. I didn't like all that motion. And when Jesus says to this storm, be still, in Greek, He's literally saying, be quiet or be muzzled. It's almost as if He's looking at this storm as if it's an animal or as if it's some sort of beast of some sort by the language that He uses. But when He exercises His mastery over creation, we're reminded of what is said of the Lord in the Old Testament. Who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I said, this far you may come, but no farther. And here your proud waves must stop. So we're seeing Lord over creation in Jesus' rebuke of the storm. And this is scattered all throughout the Scriptures where He exercises Lord over creation. Psalm 89 verse 9, You rule the raging of the sea. When, it wa when its waves rise, you still them. And again, Psalm 107 29, He calms the storm so that its waves are still. But now let's look at traits of a storm and get an idea as to what this can be mean, how it can be meaningful to us in our lives. First of all, this arose suddenly and unexpectedly. Now perhaps they knew that storms such as this happened on the Sea of Galilee, but they weren't expecting it at this time. And so suddenly and unexpectedly, this storm, here they are in the position where they are. Now take a look at your own life and you can say there are circumstances, things that arise 
suddenly and unexpectedly. And it's always the sudden and unexpected that are the most unseating of all things. I don't know if this would ever help you, but one of the things that helps me with the sudden and the unexpected is to always keep in mind as best I can that God never looks and says, oops, never saw that coming. There's not a thing that has happened in my life, however out of the ordinary, however unexpected it might have been, where God was surprised by it. I may be surprised by it. I may be upset over the whole thing, but God knew about it. And because God is Lord of creation, He is also Lord of every single problem that I may encounter. Two weeks ago, a sudden and unexpected arose in my family's life. My mother's eldest sister and the oldest of all her siblings, there were five of them, had a massive heart attack. She had had a respiratory infection, and she woke up one night, couldn't breathe, and so they thought that the respiratory infection had gotten worse. Go to the local hospital, by ambulance, she's having a massive heart attack. Take her from there to downtown Nashville, emergency open heart surgery, replacing an aortic valve. Then there's fluid on her chest after the surgery. And then she's having many strokes after the surgery. And it keeps on going on and on and on. And so she's sedated. She's ventilated. They try to bring her out. They have to put her right right back under sedation. And they're keeping her in this kind of care. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. I don't know much about medicine. But I figured this is pretty bad. And it was. She died last Monday. And tomorrow my family and I will go to Nashville and I've got to preach my aunt's funeral. You know, I've preached a lot of funerals, but it's always different when you've got to do one of your own kins. I didn't expect this. And I'm going to tell you, I don't look forward to tomorrow. I dread it. I'd much rather go and hold our youth minister's snake than do what I've got to do tomorrow. But in her last will and testament, she specified, I want Stephen to preach at my funeral. So I'm going to do it because that's what she wanted. And then you try to find words to say. And I, I still haven't figured out what I'm going to say just yet. This was sudden and unexpected. I'm living through it now. Some of you are living through it right now. Some of you have just gotten through something like this. Some of you don't even know, but something similar is about to happen in your life. And so the storms are sudden, and they're unexpected, and the sudden and unexpected is unpleasant. I like my routine. I like knowing what pretty much every day, every week is going to be like. But life isn't routine. Sometimes it's just downright ugly. And we've got to figure out, as people of faith, as Christians, How do I best navigate these murky waters that are before me? This particular storm threatened their well-being. The boat, the vessel they were in that should have been a vessel of safety was proven that it was no longer safe. Something greater than the intention of this vessel was actually overtaking the vessel. Water was coming in and filling it. And it attacked and it threatened their very well-being. And the storms sometimes are like this. You think, well, in this area, I have this safety net. Maybe it could be, well, I've got enough money in the bank that I could pay to take care of this, that, or the other. Or I've got good health insurance and we'll be all right. But you know, there are some things that no amount of money, no good health insurance or benefits, no amount of human ingenuity can ever take care of. And you get to this point and then you begin to find just exactly what your faith is made of. Has my faith always been in the material, in the things I'm able to do, in the things that I am able to provide, in the solutions that I can bring forth? Or is it so outside 
of all these things that there's nothing on earth that can help with this particular storm. And sometimes these trials create fear when there should be faith. When you look at the whole of this issue with Jesus' disciples, they're in the boat with Him. Now, when Christ took on flesh, He took on some of the limitations associated with the flesh, such as being tired. He was tired. He needed sleep. There are times He was hungry. He needed to eat, and so forth and so on. But there He was in the boat, albeit He was asleep. And I think really this is the parallel to us today. It's not that Christ is here present among us physically and literally. But we do believe that God is everywhere. And they might have thought, well, because the Lord is asleep, He is unaware of everything that we're facing and what's really worrying us. And so they cry out to Him, Master, do you not care that we're perishing? And so He comes to, He rebukes the storm and all is well. And we can't see the Lord, but we look around in the midst of our storm and sometimes we cry out, God, do you not care? God, where are you? And his response is probably likely what Jesus said to his disciples. Where's your faith? Where's your faith? The answer and the solution is always that Jesus calms the storms. It doesn't mean that they always necessarily disappear, because sometimes they don't. But sometimes in the midst of the storm, we're able through our faith to have a sense of peace, a sense of assurance that no matter what happens, no matter what comes, I'll make it. I'll be okay. And you know, what's the worst that could happen? We think the worst that could happen a lot of times is that we could die or someone could die. And you know, one of the things that I've learned, and I don't mean to be insensitive towards anybody, please don't think that I am, but I fully believe, and this is my personal belief, you don't have to share it, but I fully believe that there are some things worse than dying. Sometimes I think, I think living can be a lot worse than dying, especially if you are a Christian. Now for those that aren't Christians, I wouldn't make the same statement because I would worry a great deal about them. But I do believe there are some things worse than dying. And sometimes the worst case scenario of passing from this life doesn't mean that we no longer exist. Such as some of the funerals we've been to here recently of some faithful, loving Christians of our own congregation. It's not that they have ceased to exist. They just now exist in a different, better place. And you know, when you're at the funeral home, I try not to say things that, uh, that I find annoying. Now, again, I said to you a few weeks ago that I'm not as nice as some other people, and, uh, and it's true, you know, and there are a lot of things that annoy me. For example, when I'm at a funeral home and it's my own kin and someone comes up and says, it's God's will. Really? Pray tell, please explain to me how you know it's God's will if there were horrible circumstances surrounding the death. That annoys me. It also annoys me sometimes even when people say, well, they're in a better place. Maybe they are, but you know what? I'm selfish. I want them right here with me. I try not to say any of those things when I go to a funeral home and visit those who are grieving. I try simply just to say, I love you. I'm so sorry. Is there anything I can do? But all these, and, and I know folks are well-meaning, they're well-intentioned, but we don't know how to deal with grief. Because it makes us uncomfortable when we get around someone who's grieving. And so a lot of times we avoid the grieving people because, well, I just don't know how to feel or what to say or what to do around them. Think about what your mama used to do if you had one of those good mamas when you were a child and you were afraid. What would mama do? 
A lot of times she'd scoop you up in her arms. She'd give you a big old hug. And she'd say, it's okay. I, I think sometimes that people that are going through storms, they don't need platitudes. A lot of times they just need somebody who's willing to listen. They don't need you to say something, some motivational snippet. They just need someone to say, I care. And there may come a time when they go, and I, and I can't tell you how many people that I've visited with that, have, that are faithful Christians, that have great faith, but in the harshness of life, they go, Stephen, where was God? Now, I know some Christians would say, well, you're not supposed to question things. Folks, I believe God's shoulders are broad enough that He can take it. We're not talking about blasphemy. We're talking about someone who's having a crisis in their life. And I think above all places, the church should be one of those places where you as a Christian can be human. Or at least you should be able to be human. And go, here's where I struggle with my faith in light of life circumstances. But see, we have taken Christianity and we have boxed it in and we have said, this is how you have to be in order for God to love you. Did you know that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son? And He gave that Son loving the world in its utter misery and sinfulness. He doesn't wait for us to be good enough. He doesn't wait for us to try hard enough. He loves us right where we are and He tries to say, come out of there. But we say, you can't question, you can't doubt, you can't... You know what? Yes, you can. Because you're human. It doesn't mean you don't believe in God. It just sometimes means at the present moment you're struggling. And people have asked questions, where is God? And you know, the answer for me is always, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer. And we try to intellectualize Christianity. Well, now, in your circumstances, the Bible saith and the Bible may saith, thus and such. But can we not allow our brethren, can we not allow other people to simply be human and to hurt at times and to even be frustrated at times? Have you not read the book of Habakkuk? Have you not studied the book of Job? Have you not read much of the Old Testament when God's greatest champions of faith often had crises of faith? Not that they ever stopped believing in God, but that they were finding it hard to come to grips with life circumstances and the existence of God in light of that. Some of you have been and are hurting today. And I would only hope that you would know that you can find a safe place of love, a safe place of encouragement here at Glendale Road. But never forget that God will always see you through the storm. And never forget that Jesus always calms the storms. Let's pray before our invitation. Our gracious Father, we in the flesh miss out on seeing the grandeur of Your holy presence. Yet we have read in these holy and sacred Scriptures of just how You have been there for Your saints of old. But even still, when we face storms of our lives, we're often shaken. Our faith is sometimes on faulty ground. If it could be Your will, Father, let these occasions because for the strengthening of our faith to help pull us closer to You and not to drive us farther from You. For we, Father, are people who are prone to wander from You. So bind our hearts with the love of Christ that in all life circumstances will seek You. Bless those of our number, those who are here today, those who may not be able to be here, and the circumstances that they may be facing that may cause great pain and heartache. I pray, Father, that You will bless them with Your consolation and with Your peace. 
If it's Your will, see them through these storms. Help them to come out stronger on the other side. But if they must endure the storms for yet another time or so, give them strength that they can survive them and go through them with an even deeper sense of devotion to You and an even greater faith in You as their God. Father, thank You for seeing us all safely through the storms of life that have been through them. Help us always to be patient and long-suffering with one another, to be loving and compassionate, to be willing to listen and quick to love. It's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. If we can assist you with any spiritual or physical need, please come to the front and make it known as we stand and sing. This has been It Is Written, presented by the Glendale Road Church of Christ. We welcome your visits and communications at any time. With God's own heart.